It's a pleasure to join you today. My name is Gene Dodaro. I'm the Comptroller General of the United States and head of the Nonpartisan Government Accountability Office, the independent investigative arm of Congress. It's been a number of years since I've spoken to the Professional Services Council. Following our recent national election, the 117th Congress is set to convene in January, and the nation faces several pressing challenges. So I thought this might be a good time to discuss some of GAO's efforts to help new and returning members of Congress and their staffs learn more about GAO's work on these challenges and ideas for how our country can address them. For those of you who may be less familiar with GAO, our mission is to provide Congress with fact-based, nonpartisan information on government programs. Our goal is to improve the performance of government and help promote accountability and transparency. We also make recommendations to help government work better. Today, I'd like to talk about GAO's work in four pressing areas. The first is the COVID-19 pandemic. The second is race in America. And third is our nation's fiscal outlook. And fourth is the need to improve government performance. The current pandemic is the most serious health crisis we've faced in a century. So let's start there. It's affected everyone in some way and necessitated the largest rescue package in American history. As of now, Congress has enacted four relief laws. This includes about $2.6 trillion in emergency assistance for people, businesses, the healthcare system, and state and local governments. The March 2020 CARES Act requires GAO to issue bimonthly reports starting last June reviewing pandemic relief measures and outlining steps to improve the nation's response. In September, we issued our third and latest CARES Act report. We'll have another report coming out later this month. So far, we've made 22 recommendations to Congress and the executive branch. We believe those re suggestions, if implemented, could strengthen significantly the current pandemic response and better prepare our country for future public health emergencies. GAO's reports provide a snapshot in real time of what's working well and recommend mid-course corrections. When it comes to the medical supply chain, the federal government has taken many measures to help. However, there have been shortages of personal protective equipment and testing supplies because of limited domestic production and high global demand. GAO has urged the Department of Health and Human Services and the Federal Emergency Management Agency to move to stabilize the supply chain and work with states to plan for supply needs for the remainder of the pandemic. Another area we looked at is medical treatments. Multiple federal agencies are supporting the development and manufacture of vaccines and therapeutics for COVID-19. Considerable effort has gone into speeding up the time frame for creating a vaccine. As these efforts proceed, it's essential that the federal government produce clear plans for distributing and administering a vaccine. The government also needs to issue clear, timely and consistent communication to stakeholders and the public about those plans. Shortcomings in the collection of COVID-19 data is another concern. We need to see more complete and consistent information on testing. Better data needs to be collected to address the disproportionate burden of COVID cases, hospitalizations and death among racial and ethnic minorities. And we've also highlighted the need to capture complete data on the pandemic in nursing homes, which could be used to inform efforts to better protect this vulnerable population. IRS has issued economic impact payments to all eligible individuals for whom IRS has the necessary information to do so. However, not everyone eligible was able to be initially identified. To help ensure all eligible recipients receive their payments in a timelier manner, 
IRS took several actions to address challenges GAO reported on in June. This included a policy change that should allow some eligible recipients to receive supplemental payments for qualifying children sooner than expected. Treasury and IRS have also been able to recover $700 million from payments sent to deceased individuals in line with GAO's recommendation. Given the sweeping and unfolding public health and economic crisis, agencies from across the federal government were called on to provide immediate assistance. This required an unprecedented level of dedication and agility among the federal workforce, including those serving on the front lines, to quickly establish services for those affected with the virus. Consistent with the urgency of responding to serious and widespread health issues and economic disruptions, agencies have given priority to moving swiftly, where possible, to distribute funds and implement new programs. As trade-offs were made, however, agencies only made limited progress so far in achieving transparency and accountability goals. Our specific recommendations in this regard have included creating and implementing an oversight program to ensure program integrity and address fraud risks in the one half trillion dollar paycheck protection program at the Small Business Administration. Having Treasury and OMB quickly get out audit guidance for the $150 billion relief fund for state and local governments. Having the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention send clear and consistent guidance for the opening of schools. Urging the Department of Health and Human Services to expedite implementation of our prior recommendations regarding cybersecurity weaknesses at its component agencies, and having the Department of Labor issue guidance to state unemployment agencies to help avoid potential duplicative payments related to the Paycheck Protection Program. In addition to strengthening program management, we've also focused on fraud risk. Some individuals have already been indicted, and many investigations are underway by the Inspectors General and the Department of Justice. We've received over 1,000 tips through the GAO fraud hotline and referred them to the appropriate parties. We also issued a wide range of other products on COVID-19 related topics. These include the challenges of inspecting foreign drug manufacturers, federal contracting in response to the pandemic, the response and strains on VA's supply chain, and Federal Emergency Management Agency's role in the response, air travel and communicable diseases, and key considerations for federal agencies returning employees to workplaces during the pandemic. We also have dozens of other audits underway, and of course, we'll continue to issue our bimonthly reports. The second topic I'd like to spend some time discussing is race in America. The deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and numerous other black men and women at the hands of police have prompted demonstrations across the country and brought more attention to racial inequality. From the 1970s to the 1990s to today, GAO has provided Congress with analysis of racial inequalities. We've looked at education, voting rights, equal employment, racial profiling, representation in the census, access to capital and housing, health care, and the military justice system. In September, GAO launched a webpage on race in America. It's a collection of GAO reports on the topic. It's a good resource for anyone interested in learning more about this topic. We also have more work planned. GAO will soon be evaluating screening efforts by both the Transportation Security Administration and the U.S. Customs and Border Protection to determine whether these controls in place prevent discrimination. We started work examining law enforcement's use of force and will be looking at initiatives such as de-escalation training, 
that could help reduce the use of force. In June, more than 20 senators asked GAO to review federal law enforcement's use of less lethal force on protesters during civil disturbances. This includes items like rubber bullets and tear gas. In response to concerns that facial recognition technology poses risks to privacy and other civil liberties, JO will be surveying federal agencies like the FBI and the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement about their use of such technology. Recently, JO was also asked to review the prevalence and impact of racial discrimination at the Department of Veterans Affairs, including discrimination affecting VA employees and veterans who visit VA facilities to obtain services. When it comes to GAO itself, I often say that our greatest asset is our people. But GAO's reputation as a leading employer depends on more than just professional expertise. It also reflects our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as our people values, which emphasize respecting, valuing, and treating people fairly. I'm personally committed to this issue, and I'm very proud of GAO's high ratings in the yearly list of the best places to work in the federal government. That includes a number one ranking in support of diversity among agencies of our size. Next. Let me turn to the fiscal outlook for our nation's finances. Clearly, preventative measures to stop the spread of COVID-19 had immediate economic consequences. While the national economy has improved since the spring, employment remains substantially lower than before the pandemic. In the short run, the outlook for the economy will continue to be influenced by the repercussions from COVID-19. In the past, GAO has done considerable work examining the federal response to and recovery from past economic shocks. We've issued many reports on the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009, and many of the topics we've addressed over the years are extremely relevant today. For example, unemployment insurance continues to be critical to helping many Americans who've lost jobs. In the housing area, states, and the federal government have set moratoriums on evictions and made mortgage forbearance available. But there are concerns that when those end, there may be additional evictions, foreclosures, and possible increases in homelessness and food security. In addition, many small businesses are crucial to our economy, and yet many have closed, and the survival of others is threatened. Debt is another area we're keeping an eye on. Private companies, both big and small, and citizens with high debt are vulnerable during recessions. National and consumer debt had continued to soar even before the pandemic. Outstanding federal student loan debt related defaults continue to be a much discussed issue. And many American households have little or no retirement savings. The pandemic is making the situation even worse. The pandemic has necessitated a major federal response to address our national public health emergency and resulting economic turmoil. While it's essential to confront COVID-19 and to heal our economy, these efforts have further complicated our government's fiscal condition. Frankly, I've been concerned for some time about the federal government's fiscal outlook. GAO issues an annual report on the nation's fiscal health, and that report makes clear that our long-term fiscal path is unsustainable. A key problem is that federal debt is growing faster than the size of the economy. By the end of fiscal year 2019, debt held by the public had climbed to 79% of gross domestic product, or GDP, compared to an average of 46%, since 1946. CBO expects it to reach 107% of GDP by 2023 and by 195% by 2050 if no action is taken. Currently, the federal government lacks a long-term plan to control our growing debt. Once the current crisis abates, 
Congress and the administration need to swiftly approve a broad plan to put the federal government on a more sustainable long-term fiscal path. Such a plan can help ensure that the United States is in a strong position to meet its domestic and national security needs. It can also ensure that we retain the flexibility to address unforeseen events like natural disasters. Policymakers will need to consider changes to the entire range of federal activities. This includes entitlement programs, other mandatory spending, discretionary spending, revenues, and tax expenditures. As GAO and CBO both pointed out, the longer we postpone dealing with the federal debt, the more drastic the changes that will need be needed on spending and revenues. We also need to confront near-term decisions on key trust funds. According to the latest estimates, the Highway Trust Fund is going to be depleted this fiscal year. The Medicare Hospital Insurance Trust Fund is estimated to be able to pay only 83 cents on the dollar by 2024. The Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation Multi-Employer Program is expected to be insolvent by 2026, and the Social Security Old Age and Survivors Insurance Trust Fund is expected to only be able to pay 75 cents on the dollar by 2031. As I recently testified before both the Senate Budget Committee and the Senate Finance Committee, to help address all of these issues, a comprehensive plan is needed. It should include clear goals and objectives agreed to by the Congress and the administration and strategies to help achieve them. Fiscal rules should be included, such as a target debt to GDP ratio. Other key considerations to be included are a solid legal structure that allows it to be sustained over time, integration into the budget process, flexibility to allow for contingencies, and clear transparency and accountability to show progress in meeting clear goals, objectives, and targets. Finally, I'd like to talk about the need to improve the performance of the federal government. Our government has a major role to play in protecting public health and safety, improving infrastructure, keeping the military ready, and promoting economic growth. People expect these things from their government, and rightly so. Building trust in government is easier if our government works better. Contractors have a role to play in helping government achieve better outcomes. Unfortunately, GAO has found serious shortcomings in the government's ability to meet the needs of the American people in a rapidly changing world. This includes weaknesses in areas like cybersecurity, human capital management, investments in information technology, and contract management. The public sector needs to be more nimble and be able to work across institutional lines more effectively and partner with agencies both across the federal government as well as with the private and nonprofit sectors and state and local governments. Human capital management is an area where the federal government needs to play catch up. When it comes to the federal workforce, we know there are current eminent staff shortfalls in key areas like science and technology, engineering, mathematics, and cybersecurity. We also know there's an urgent need for new skills across government, a need that's outpacing government's ability to acquire needed talent. Effective workforce planning will need to also anticipate future employee retirements. The simple truth is that the critical work of government can't get done properly without having people with the right skills in the right place at the right time. Federal agencies also invest more than $90 billion annually in information technology, yet even so, IT investments have too often failed or contributed little to mission-related outcomes. To improve the management of IT acquisitions and operations, agencies need to continue to focus on the requirements of federal IT acquisition reforms. These efforts include implementing chief information officer responsibilities effectively, 
improving CIO involvement in the IT acquisition review, consolidating data centers, and managing software licenses. As of July 2020, federal agencies had fully implemented 64% of the over 1,300 management-related recommendations that GAO has made to them since fiscal year 2010. Thus, a significant number of actions remain to be completed to build upon this progress. Among other things, it's critical that agencies implement policies that give CIOs the authority to effectively carry out their responsibilities for IT budgeting, information security, IT strategic planning, and the IT workforce. Agencies should also develop plans to modernize or replace critical legacy systems and to consolidate and eliminate duplicative systems by improving their portfolio stat process. This process requires agencies to conduct annual reviews of their IT investments and make decisions on eliminating duplication. I've also been long concerned about the cybersecurity of our nation, and I've emphasized the need for the government to move with a sense of urgency commensurate with the rapidly evolving threats. Federal agencies and other entities need to take urgent actions to implement a comprehensive national cybersecurity strategy, secure federal systems, protect the nation's critical infrastructure, and ensure the privacy of U.S. citizens. These efforts must include addressing global supply chain issues and emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, overcoming workforce challenges, and fixing known security weaknesses that plague our nation's computer networks. Over the last 10 years, GAO has issued thousands of recommendations aimed at cybersecurity improvements, but hundreds still remain unimplemented. We've also recommended that Congress create legislation to establish a national cybersecurity coordinator position and craft a comprehensive privacy framework for the private sector. Let's look at contracting issues as well in the current environment. Spending for COVID-related response and recovery efforts has now reached about $25 billion. Agencies are using various flexibilities and authorities in their pandemic spending. For example, they can use the Defense Production Act to expand production capacity in acquiring needed supplies like ventilators or respirators. We have a report coming out later this month describing how that authority has been used. Agencies can also turn to transaction agreements. There have been about $7 billion worth of those as of July 2020. We saw their use in supporting vaccine development under Operation Warp Speed. As you know, other transactions fall outside the federal acquisition regulation and enable agencies to tailor provisions, such as intellectual property provisions, to meet each party's needs. Providing transparency and accountability for these actions is essential. But government agencies were going to stop using the National Interest Action Code to track these actions in late summer, well before the need to award contracts would have ended. We've encouraged the Departments of Defense and Homeland Security, along with other agencies, to extend the use of the code, and they've agreed to do so at least until March of next year. When we get back to the new normal after the pandemic is over, several pressing issues will affect the federal acquisition and contractor communities. One issue on our radar screen is ensuring the acquisition workforce is equipped to handle emerging issues. This would include things like cybersecurity developments and ever more complex information technology acquisitions. We've seen the Pentagon uh, workforce grow, for example, considerably since 20, uh, 2009 when it started to rebuild its workforce but the military needs to continue to find ways to hire, train, and retain qualified staff in the future. As you're well aware, it's also urgent that the government and the contractor community protect information stored in their networks. 
GAO will be assessing how the phased approach for the cybersecurity maturity model certification is working. Similarly, Congress enacted legislation prohibiting the federal government from contracting with any entity using telecommunications equipment from five Chinese companies, including Huawei and ZTE. GAO will be looking to the PSC and other industry associations for their perspectives on progress and challenges in implementing the ban. In February, GAO will be updating its high-risk list. We issue the list every two years with the start of each new Congress to help build the tension to federal programs and activities that are at the highest risk of fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement, or in need of broad-based transformation. In our last high-risk list, which we issued in 2019, the rankings for more than half of the 30-plus areas on the list remain largely unchanged, with three areas regressing. Ratings for seven areas improved, with two areas making enough progress to be removed from the list. The opioid epidemic has had a devastating impact on many communities across the country. We've already announced uh, plans to add the broader issue of drug misuse to our list in 2021. We've also already added acquisition management at the Department of Veterans Affairs to the list after identifying several major contracting challenges at VA. GAO makes every effort to help programs and agencies get off the high-risk list. We work closely with senior officials at relevant agencies to help identify the root causes of any problems, and we encourage them to develop action plans to tackle those issues head on. Then we monitor their progress against these plans. Our hope is that agencies will make enough progress to drop them from the list. But of course, hope does not substitute for actual verifiable data, which is what we base our independent assessments on. I'd like to say a few words about GAO's recent efforts to update its body of work on commercial leading practices. Under the leadership of our contracting and national security acquisitions team, we're investing in new work to learn how federal acquisition programs could benefit from leading commercial companies' product development models and practices. This work follows foundational work we completed in the early 2000s. That work found that leading companies benefit by obtaining knowledge at key points in product development. Such knowledge is often not present early enough in government programs, even though it can be vital to achieving better outcomes. The world has changed dramatically in the past 20 years, as have the products that leading commercial firms and government agencies develop and acquire software capabilities and cybersecurity considerations, as well as new tools for digital engineering, among other factors, have contributed to these changes. We think it's only prudent to revisit GAO's past work and re-engage leading companies to understand how they now approach product development. When completed, this initiative should help GAO better assess the government's acquisition efforts and make constructive recommendations for improvement. In conclusion, I've appreciated the opportunity to discuss GAO's work on some of the many challenging issues facing our nation. Next year, GAO will celebrate its 100th anniversary. I've been at the agency since 1973 when I joined as an entry-level auditor, and it's been a real privilege to have worked with so many talented and committed colleagues over the years. While the nation faces many challenges, I think they are all surmountable. I'm optimistic that Americans can and will meet these challenges. We just have to work together and to commit ourselves to a better future. Thank you for your time.